you like to please to answer this. We've got some South Americans in, that's brilliant. Uh, South Africa is still around. I don't suppose we'll have anybody from Australasia now because it's, um, it's about four o'clock in the morning in Australia. Okay, last second, I shan't labor the point. Any more? Oh, good, still some people answering. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, next question is um, sort of demographic. So what's your main occupation or your main role? Um, um, and if you are other, if you um, would like to um, put something in the chat box about what the other is, that would be interesting, especially as we seem to have several. Okay, thank you for that. We've still got time, Melissa, for uh, if you want to um, do this second one. Okay. Thank you for that. And finally, we're interested in um, where you're connecting from. Oops, excuse me a minute. Finger trouble. Let me clear down the previous answers. Looks like most, but not everybody's from home. Okay. And thank you. Okay, Catherine, back to you. It's all yours. And while we were polling, guess what I found? I found the right email, so I am going to um, proceed with some introductions here, I believe. Um, let's see. Although, it looks like I see Erica's, Eliska's, and Electra's. So, Elena, if you want to go ahead and start and introduce yourself. and. Um, then Erin can go ahead and introduce herself as well when she takes over. Can you hear me? You have me? the mic. Uh -huh. Hi, my name, is, my name is Elena Ateva, and I am the, um, uh, on the Board of Editors of Human Rights in Childbirth, and Erin uh, Duncan is uh, another attorney, so I'm an attorney, she's another attorney who volunteers with Human Rights in Childbirth, and Aliska Kudyosova is joining us from the Czech Republic, and she is with one of the oldest NGOs in the Czech Republic, Aperio, which advocates for uh, improving maternity care in, in that country. And today we would be uh, talking to you about CEDO, which is the um, I'm just going to go one slide back. 
CETO is the International Convention, the UN Convention um, on eliminating all kinds, all forms of discrimination against women. Okay, and I don't see that. But um, so it is a UN Convention. It is probably the most important UN Convention on women's rights. It was adopted in 1979 by the UN General Assembly, and in, in 81 it entered into force when enough countries signed on. Um, and it includes obligations uh, to states to take all necessary steps to safeguard rights from infringement by third parties. Almost every country in the world has signed uh, that convention, uh, with very uh, few exceptions. And I, I noticed that a lot of you are from the United States because we are in that time zone. Um, and there was somebody from Iran. And I'm sorry to say that your country has not um, adopted CETO yet. But these are the, the few countries that haven't adopted CETO. But, but chances are um, that your country has adopted it. Because if you see the map, um, almost everybody else has. And even if your country has not ratified CETO, we will talk about what your options are to advocate. Uh, using that document. So it is not just a tool for rights enforcement, but for rights education as well. Um, in its preamble, the convention explicitly acknowledges that extensive discrimination against women continues to exist, and emphasizes that such discrimination violates the principles of equality of rights and respect for human dignity. And it also sets the tone regarding um, childbirth, that the role of women of procreation should not be the basis for discrimination. There are a few articles that directly relate um, and can be used when advocating for human rights in childbirth. Article 1 is uh, the definition of discrimination, and it's very all-encompassing. So if you are wondering if something, um, you know, you can't find something in the text, and if you're wondering if it's included, it's probably included. The chances are it's included. Uh, articles 2 and 3 establish the state responsibility to ensure that women are not discriminated against. And it, it doesn't just mean adopting legislation, but taking all appropriate measures. And sometimes those measures could be temporary special measures uh, for substantive equality, um, so measures that uh, relate to, to maternity, for example. Uh, these measures could be taken. Um, Article 5 talks about uh, gender stereotypes, which also um, play a role when we talk about violations of human rights in childbirth. And Article 12 is the article that specifies the right to health with special consideration in pregnancy and childbirth. There's also another Elena, text. Um, you should... I'm sorry, Elena. It's Erin. I was hoping to just jump in very quickly on one point, if we can go back. Sure. Um, um, I just want folks to know that, that substantive equality, sort of what that means, and the differences between formal equality, where you're treating everyone the same. In some, some instances, you need to treat people differently. And of course, in the context of pregnancy, uh, you treat women differently where necessary in order to achieve actual equality. So that's the concept of substantive equality. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And that's, yes, um, and, and Article uh, 12 also goes to state that not, notwithstanding the right not to discriminate, in Article 12 regarding health, in general, when we talk about maternity, um, pregnancy, and confinement, we have to treat women different, differently because of their biological uh, function, which, which means uh, that they need special considerations. Um, there's a, a general recommendation issued by the CETO committee, and we'll talk about the committee in just a minute. Uh, but that re recommendation, it's number 24 on women and health, and it goes into um, um, more detail about what, uh, what that protection means. Um, it, so it provides elaboration on Article 12. It talks about of, uh, the obligation of the states to respect, protect, and fulfill women's rights to health care. Um, so the right to respect usually means not to infringe. 
to protect, it means that it needs to, to protect against infringement from others, from third parties, and this could include, for example, private hospitals. And, and the last um, requirement to fulfill women's rights to health care means that there is a positive obligation on the state as well. Um, the same recommendation reiterates the need of availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of health services. And there are special state obligations uh, written which require all health services to be consistent with the human rights of women, including the rights to autonomy, privacy, confidentiality, informed consent, and choice. So the Pluto Committee is uh, a committee of uh, women's rights experts, 23 women's rights experts, uh, and that committee monitors the implementation of the CEDAW Convention. It gathers three times a year in Geneva, and it reviews states' reports. Um, so states need to submit reports every four years that state what steps uh, the state has taken to implement the Convention in that particular country. The committee also accepts shadow reports. Um, because they don't have offices uh, in, in different countries, they can't travel to different countries to really see what is happening, and they only receive the state reports. Um, they also allow civil society to submit alternative reports or shadow reports. Um, and those reports usually elaborate more on uh, what violations women's, women are facing in that country, things that maybe the, the state um, omitted from their report. Um, and the CEDAW committee also issues recommendations to the states on what measures they need to take further to improve the implementation of, of the convention. Uh, and then in special circumstances, it issues those general recommendations that are to um, all signatories to the convention, uh, such as the, the general recommendation 24 that I just mentioned. Um, that's just, the, I'm not sure if you can see that, it's a list of the committee members just to, to give you an overview, they really come from different countries, and uh, what, what unites them, I think, is the, that they are really experts in women's rights. Um, shadow reports are submitted, uh, so usually shadow reports are submitted only when state reports are submitted. And states are required to submit every four years, but that it doesn't always happen, so you can't rely on, on that. Uh, you have to kind of monitor the, the website of the committee and see they usually have uh, a list for the next year and a half of what states would be reporting, and then you know that you can submit a, a shadow report uh, for that particular state. Um, some, for some recommendations, states must, must submit a two-year interim report on progress of implementation, and we'll talk about that later when we um, talk about the, the example of Greece. So this is really an opportunity for civil society to weigh in and, and show the specific issues that women face in their country and, and really um, get international attention to those issues. The committee reviews the state report and the shadow report, um, engages in, in what is called constructive dialogue with the state, this is what happens in Geneva, and then issues recommendations to the state on what steps need to be taken to implement the convention. And this is really, this is your opportunity um, as midwives, um, as researchers, as lecturers, um, even as student midwives, I mean, really, um, there is a place for you to um, either work with other uh, organizations or on your own and to bring attention to violations of human rights and childbirth that you know of in your country. And I'll just like to point a few examples of how shadow reports have been used uh, specifically for human rights and childbirth. Most recently, Ecuador submitted a report in uh, February of 2015. Uh, the comments from, from civil society included comments on obstetric violence as an invisible form of gender violence predicated on the power dynamic between women and health professional, professionals, and also comments on the lack of legislation of outlawing obstetric violence. Um, there were also um, oral comments, uh, so NGOs can also um, comment orally at the session, very briefly, really, but apparently there were oral comments, um, and the committee's recommendation to the state includes those oral comments. They say that they're concerned about barriers faced by indigenous Afro-Ecuadorian and 
few women in gaining access to health services that meet their needs and respect their health approaches, including the practice of vertical births followed by Indigenous women. And the recommendation is to the stages to adopt the Bill on Intercultural Practice for Assisted Births under the National Health System with the aim of recognizing intercultural care during delivery. So, you know, this, this organization then can go home and can use the, the CEDAW recommendation to advocate further on adopting a bill that was apparently already written. Um, but, you know, it, it gives them that strength, you know, that an international body issued that recommendation. Um, and maybe they can get more media attention. It just strengthens their work. Uh, so it, it, it's a part of, of your advocacy strategy. Hungary in 2013, um, the report from civil society included comments on high rates of intervention and the lack of recognition of independent midwives due to restrictive laws and lack of state funding, and also comments on the imprisonment of, of midwife Agnes Gerev. Um, it also included comments on course sterilization of Romani women. The recommendation from the CEDAW committee was to ensure a women's choice to give birth at home or in a hospital by recognizing trained midwives as independent professionals and by elaborating a legal framework and guidelines on security of home deliveries and providing training of obstetricians. I'm not sure if we'll have um, time to go through all of this. Um, Greece. Um, the, the example of Greece is really interesting. I'm really sorry that Alec Cherkodrow could not join us today, uh, but uh, we were together at a different conference two weeks ago, and I can tell you what she told me then. Uh, so she um, contacted uh, an attorney who was already submitting a shadow report, uh, but that was barely two weeks before the session itself, so really late in the process. But she contacted that attorney and told him, well, can you, can you talk about the high rates of cesarean sections that, that we're facing? And uh, he included that in his oral presentation, and the committee issued the following recommendation. The committee is also concerned at the extremely high rate of cesarean sections performed in public, 40%, and private, up to 65% hospitals without medical justification. The Greek rates being the highest in the world, way above the 15% rate considered by the World Health Organization as covering medical needs. The committee urges the state party to reduce the rate of cesarean sections performed without medical necessity by training or retraining medical personnel on natural birth and introduce strict control of medical indications for cesarean sections in order to reach the WHO recognized rates. And in this case, uh, the Greek state is then uh, required to report in two years on what progress was made on reducing the cesarean uh, section rate in Greece. We have other examples, but um, I, I think that we're not going to have time for them. We'll have the presentation uh, available on the website of Sanitizing Childbirth. So don't worry, I'll just quickly show you. So this is Bulgarian 2012. Um, and this is a more general recommendation. Then the Czech Republic will hear uh, from Eliska personally, and she was involved in that report. And I'm ha uh, handing it over to Erin. Thanks, Elena. So can everyone hear me OK? Someone in chat maybe let me know? Great. Uh, so I'm joining you from Oregon. I'm a lawyer here, and um, I'll just move forward. So we have a link here. This is also will be linked from our website at humanrightsandchildbirth.org. If you go to our CEDAW page, you'll see that link at the end of this session um, to look up when your country will be reviewed. So you want to go fairly early and see what's going on in the next few years. I know they have uh, through, I think, July 2016 posted right now. And this is because the uh, process for submitting shadow reports really starts a lot earlier than the formal review session. And so I'll, I'll just move on to this next page. So the formal review, it's about a year earlier. You want to find out when your actual review session is happening and when your pre-committee session is happening. So there's several meetings of the committee in Geneva. And the goal is to try to submit your shadow report uh, for that pre-committee session. That's when the committee is discussing the reports and developing what's called its list of issues and questions, which form the basis for the state review. 
So when the state submits its own report, uh, it might raise issues or it might not raise issues that are important to women in the country. And so the goal is to put forth what you believe are, are the most critical issues facing, facing women and have the committee actually ask the state about those, even if the state didn't raise those issues themselves. Uh, like Elena said, don't be discouraged if you're late. You can, with the example of Greece, they got that information in at the last minute. Um, so there's ways to sort of jump on with other NGO groups and, and try to get your issue out there. The CEDAW committee does prefer reports from working coalitions of NGOs, so they don't have a, a bunch of disparate reports. It's helpful to try to work together with a coalition, but it does it also accept reports from individual groups on particular issues. Um, so that's a possibility. And, and we've been debating whether or not they'll actually accept uh, reports from individuals. If you, if you can't find a group to work with, I think that is a possibility. Uh, I would suggest talking to International Women's Rights Action Watch, which we'll have a link for them later. They do a lot of support work um, with CEDA, and they might be able to connect you and, and figure out how you could submit a report on your own. So the shadow report can't just be a, a long list of your issues. It really should be tailored to the convention. So it's helpful to go back to the language of the convention of CEDA and identify which articles are actually relevant to the issues you're addressing. So I put together a, just a little example here. Uh, the language in Article 12 says states must provide appropriate services in connection with pregnancy. So that's fairly broad, but you can tailor uh, a list of questions and recommendations to that language. For instance, does the state have policies in place to ensure that healthcare providers are informed about and utilizing evidence-based care? So in your report, you can, can raise those questions and then answer those questions by also putting the data in the report um, and answering those questions. So here's answer the questions using supportive data. For instance, common breaches of evidence-based care in the state include excessive use of electronic fetal moder monitoring, which can dramatically increase rates of unnecessary C-section. And then, of course, you want to have some footnotes or some documentation to support uh, that data that you are supplying. In preparing your report, it's helpful to obtain the current state report if it's already available. And from that link that we showed earlier where you find out when the session is actually occurring, you can go there and, and access the state report. Uh, you, you can also sometimes access a state report from the government itself earlier than when it's going to be actually posted on the UN sites. And so you might want to contact the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, see if you can try to get access to the state report as early as possible. It's helpful to review previous concluding observations from prior sessions, um, address the extent or effectiveness of implementation of prior c concluding observations, and identify gaps and issues that have not been previously addressed. So maybe, you know, we see in some of the examples Elena was pointing out earlier, <coughs> excuse me, there were concluding observations regarding human rights in childbirth. And so now for those next sessions, if you are from one of those countries, you want to look at those recommendations and in your next report, just figure out has your state actually been complying with those prior concluding observations. So this is just a little general list. Be specific. Prioritize your issues. Uh, give contextual economic and political info. We saw that list of who the committee members are, and they're coming from a lot of different countries. So remember that the, the, it's really an international committee, and you might need to provide some context uh, for your particular issue. And again, also for that reason, use easily understood language for non-native speakers. Um, you can put your report together in different languages. I, I'm trying to remember, I think CEDA has, it ha it has to be one of certain languages, but then it gets translated uh, into a number of the, the UN languages so that everyone can have access. So we have sort of asking the question based on the article, supp supplying the 
data to support your answer. And then you want to also try to include concrete recommendations for state improvement. So using my previous example, you could say the state should formulate training curricula and promote changes in the behavior and attitudes of healthcare professionals to ensure that now routine practices, which do not actually have evidence-based indications that the expected benefits will outweigh the potential harms, are eliminated from routine care of low-risk pregnant women. So something like the electronic fetal monitoring, which doesn't have evidence-based indications, uh, you're making that recommendation that the, you're essentially recommending that the committee recommend this, your recommendation to the state uh, and, and find support for that. Again, you want to be specific with your recommendations and think about who should be involved, what data is required uh, in order to make those changes, what resources are required, what's an appropriate timeline. Um, you, you want to try to show the committee that the state should be able to accomplish these recommendations, even if you have a state with limited resources. Uh, be specific about what, what you think the state is capable of doing, doing to improve the situation. You do want to organize your report around the committee guidelines for state reports. So again, the, the language of shadow reporting, you're, you're trying to organize your own report to, to, in some ways, respond to the state report. The, I won't get into this too much. Um, again, the International Women's Rights Action Watch group has some great resources on actually developing your shadow report, and so we can link you to them. Uh, but part of this is that there's now requirements about something called a common core document that the state has to put together that there's sort of two separate documents for the state report, so you want to address both of those documents in your shadow report. That's getting a little bit too much into the details right now, but again, we'll link you to some resources that can help you with preparation. So you want to submit your report several weeks before the pre-session meeting of the committee. Again, you should be able to figure out when your pre-session meetings are from that original uh, link that we have for when the formal review sessions are. There also is information about the pre-session meetings. And like Elena said, you can also send representatives to those meetings. Um, so if possible, you know, plan far ahead if you're going to be part of a coalition putting together a report. See if you can get some funding and send a few folks to Geneva to try to brief the committee on some of these, these issues. So when you're in Geneva, it, you, you won't have a lot of time, unfortunately. Um, I haven't been there, so I don't know exactly how it works, but my understanding is that you, you get a few minutes to speak before the committee, try to connect with other NGOs, uh, be concise about the issues and, and putting forward really the, the key points. Learn what you can about the committee members beforehand. Try to catch them by name during breaks. Invite them out to lunch. You're really just trying to get their ear uh, during this time when they're developing that list of issues and questions. It's just a picture from the one of the sessions there. And remember that, that this doesn't stop with your just submitting the report. You want to use those concluding observations, use those outcomes at the inter that from the international level and relate them back to your domestic campaigns. So you want to find out, are your domestic decision makers aware of these concluding observations? And can you use those observations, not let them go unnoticed? Um, talk to your government. Use them to focus your own field work. Um, and then, of course, use them in future advocacy for CEDA again. I think uh, that was the end of our slides there. OK, well, it so I'm going to turn it over to. We had one more slide, but it probably got cut off with, with the link. If, um, and Sorry. Maybe sharing some personal experiences with advocacy for women's rights in childbirth? Catherine, actually, we, I think we we're going to turn it over to Alishka.
Okay. So if Alishka is there, if you can, if you want to, she's going to share some of her work um, in the Czech Republic and actually working on recommendations to CEDA from personal experience. going to turn off the recording and we're going to have another part of the presentation. Great. Hi, can you hear me? <coughs> Hello. I can hear you, Alishka. Okay, great. Thank you for confirming this. Uh, can you please go back to the slides uh, on CDAF in the Czech Republic so that I can follow them? Uh, otherwise, let's introduce myself. Uh, I am a psychologist by profession and I wrote the part uh, of the CDAF shadow report for the Czech Republic. Um, I work at a barrier which, uh, as Elena said, uh, is a is an organization that supports parents uh, to make their own decisions around parenting, including, and most importantly, childbirth. And uh, uh, we worked on that uh, CEDAW shadow report for 2010 submission uh, as part of uh, the Czech uh, Women's Lobby, which is a local group of the European Women's Lobby. Uh, it's uh, well. It's uh, a group of organizations that support women's rights uh, in general in all areas. So you are put together quite a strong case uh, for um, for the situation about women's rights uh, in different areas. And uh, we were proud to prepare the part on health and uh, which for us meant uh, mainly uh, maternity care pregnancy care. And uh, uh, also part of the report was uh, on health was uh, forced sterilizations of uh, Roma women in the Czech Republic, which was not a very nice part of the Czech history in the 90s. And uh, well, but back to the uh, back to pregnancy and childbirth related issues. Uh, you can see on the slide uh, the main uh, issues uh, that we commented on. We focused mainly on uh, how women uh, can choose uh, where, how, and with whom they will give birth. Uh, because in the Czech Republic, uh, we have quite a good network of maternity hospitals, but uh, it is difficult to find a midwife to uh, support you when you decide to have a home birth. and. Uh, when you find this midwife and she is willing to uh, to accompany your birth uh, then you might then you may face uh, other obstacles uh, such as registration of the child in uh, the state registry or uh, finding a pediatrician who will take care of your child uh, of course we also uh, commented on um, um, how uh, informed consent is not always uh, given by women uh, for all sorts of interventions. So it was also an important thing. Uh, I would like to stress here how important it was for us to work here with uh, midwives and midwifery organizations. Because we, uh, as, a, as an organization, represent mainly parents, mothers, and fathers uh, who told us about their experience of childbirth. But for us, midwives were kind of, uh, they are those who uh, gave us information on uh, what is going on in hospitals on a daily basis. Uh, they ha uh, Midwives uh, see what is going on in hospitals in other kinds of settings uh, every day, so they can report what is happening, what uh, issues are the most, are most important. Uh, they can give you, um, they could give us a more colored, uh, a more varied picture of the situation in the Czech Republic than um, just statistics or uh, stories, uh, birth stories we heard from parents, even though they are very important for us. And uh, that's why we, that's why we collaborated with them on preparing the CEDAW shadow report. 
and I think that this is what made such an impact uh, at the committee. Can I please ask you to show another slide, Elena? I'm not sure how to move it. Yes, thank you. Uh, here you can see the recommendations that we uh, that the Czech Republic uh, received uh, from uh, the CEDA committee, and uh, you are really glad uh, that uh, many of the uh, of the issues that we included in the report were actually confirmed as important uh, in the uh, by the committee. And what we did uh, uh, was that we uh, sent as a whole group, as the Czech Women's Lobby, a representative to the Geneva, just as Erin er mentioned. It was really, I have to say that uh, Elena's and Erin's uh, description of uh, the whole procedure was really exhausting. And uh, we are going to prepare the shadow report for next year, because this is the year when we will uh, have to, s when the Czech Republic will defend it again. Uh, it, I, I'm sure that we are going to use it again and uh, as a as a groundwork for what we are going to do. So that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you. Post it in the chat box the link um, to the document that we have prepared with more information um, on how you can prepare a shadow report and, and some of the information that we mentioned here. We will also upload this presentation there as well, and the recording will be available. Uh, but I just wanted you to, to draw your attention to that link as well. And I just wanted to note, this is Erin again, uh, our last slide that didn't make it up said, human rights are not just aspirational, and to use the existing framework to affect real systemic change. So I think a lot of times we think of human rights as being this thing, this sort of overarching idea, but actually there are real existing legal frameworks to take some action. And on the other hand, when you have states that haven't ratified the treaty, uh, it's it's a great tool for education and using the statement of rights in the context of childbirth, it's really a powerful tool to know that those rights are supported by international law, that when you have a bad gut feeling about how you're being treated by a provider or something, that might actually be what could be considered a human rights violation. And now we'll open it up for questions. We had requested the first slide with the CEDAW definitions. Is, uh, is this it? The articles? And it's fairly easy to find the, the full text of CEDAW in several languages. You can just Google it and, and look through the articles with the definitions of discrimination. We also have it linked from that human rights and childbirth uh, site that Elena has put in the chat. There are also, um, I just need to make sure you have the correct link. So this is the link to the CEDAW committee. Um, th there is an old website that used to host the CEDAW committee and the convention. Um, it's a UN website. And then uh, there were some structural changes in the the committee just moved, <laughs> uh, so they have a new website. So this is the correct website. It's the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights website. Uh, and if you if you go to the website, you can check, um, like we had uh, before, on, on the upper right corner under session. If you click on that, you can see which countries are scheduled to be reviewed in the next maybe year and a half to two years. So you can see if your country is on that list.
Okay, well, that was certainly a very interesting perspective and certainly a framework that um, those of us down in the trenches um, are not often aware of. So we really sincerely thank you for all the information that you've brought to us. Thank you for hosting us, and thank you to the organizers. I think this is uh, an amazing gathering um, and, and very accessible, too. I think this is my third year in a row uh, participating, and I really appreciate that I don't have to uh, you know, be away from my family. Um, I can actually do things around the house. Usually I'm listening, and, and I think this is amazing. It's very, very accessible. Um, I also like to, to thank uh, Jette Errol Clausen, uh, who's my friend and a midwife from Denmark, and who encouraged me to submit um, an abstract. She said that this is something that midwives should be aware of. And, um, and I said, well, why not? I, I think it's great. So I really hope that you um, take that presentation and, and think about the options that you have to, to advocate on an international level for, for humanity in childbirth. OK. Thank Carla, you. did you want the mic, or are you going to continue um, typing, Carlene? Oh, OK. So you just typed in a comment. Great. OK, so we're going to wrap up and um, continue with the goodbye slides and the request for feedback. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs>